Hello, in human form here. Before the video, just wanted to remind you to subscribe to my channel if you enjoy. Everyone knows that the future is uncertain, yet we are still shocked when something completely out of the ordinary occurs. In recent years, the impact of improbable events have made us suspicious. We've convinced ourselves that we have a sense of control through the shifting sands of reality, but in truth, even the most certain parts of our lives cannot be relied upon. This video will look at why that reality seems more and more unpredictable every day, and analyze some of the most consequential events in our recent history. In 2007, statistician and former options trader Nassim Nicholas Talib published his second book, The Black Swan, to widespread acclaim. Talib's mix of counterintuitive ideas, common sense, and disdain for conventional opinion caught on in a big way. Talib argued that our most sophisticated prediction models are worse than useless. They actively blind us to the most dangerous and unpredictable events that could happen and by following past performance too closely, they hide how future results could be skewed by extremely rare events. He called it the Black Swan Theory, named after the European reaction to the discovery and shock of black swans in Australia. Talib stated that there are three criteria to identify a black swan event. They are rare enough that they are believed to be impossible. They're so consequential, their impacts far exceed what anyone could plan for. And once they happen, people will come up with stories to pretend they were more predictable than they were before they happened. But their unlikelihood teaches observers to expect them less because confidence is the highest right before disaster strikes. That's the danger of the black swan. Our story begins in the late 50s when the Eisenhower administration, secure in the assumption that the hints of leaking US hegemony weren't that important, were woken up by one of the most consequential black swans of the second half of the 20th century. On February 27th, 1956, only days after exposing the bloody legacy of Stalin's crimes at the 20th Congress of the Communist Party, Leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, made a long-delayed visit to OKB-1, an aerospace manufacturer in Podlipki, near Moscow. With awe and amazement, but still without the full realization of its historic significance, the Soviet leader and his entourage saw the coming of the space age in the form of a full-scale mock-up of the enormous R-7 rocket, which was built to carry the Soviet satellite known as Object D. Lead Soviet rocket engineer Sergei Korolev reminded Khrushchev that with this new and massive rocket, America would no longer remain unreachable in technological advances. To Khrushchev and his cohorts, the importance of military goals for the rocket far outweighed the significance of the satellite's impact on the space race. Nevertheless, Khrushchev gave Korolev his blessing. But by the end of 1956, it became clear that the complexity of the ambitious design meant that Object D could not be launched in time, as United States President Eisenhower had formally announced the intention to launch a satellite during the International Geophysical Year. Korolev and his team had now found themselves in a messy situation. Fighting the clock to successfully achieve one of humanity's greatest milestones, Korolev and his team drew up a plan to beat the Americans by setting Object D aside for the time being, and building a lighter, simpler satellite with less scientific equipment. Only a few months later, without warning, at a Cosmodrome 370 kilometers southwest of the small town of Baikonur in Kazakhstan, then part of the Soviet Union. 
Korolev and his team shot up a 184-pound aluminum sphere, known as Sputnik, into orbit. As Sputnik lifted off into the night sky over Kazakhstan, the Soviets rejoiced. Austere men who had worked on the project for months had tears in their eyes. There were kisses, hugs, and cries of celebration in the control room. What the American people believed until that point was that the Soviets had massive amounts of manpower and raw force, but they were not sophisticated enough to match the technological capabilities of the United States. They were wrong. Sputnik was groundbreaking and shattered the illusions the Americans had about the Soviets. President Eisenhower and his administration were caught flat-footed, and in an effort to dismiss the significance of the Soviet Union's achievement to the public, they downplayed its significance, but the media stirred a moral panic by writing sensational pieces on the event. Politicians and average Americans reacted in shock. To them, the dark skies above them now looked vast and dangerous, a symbol of their loss of status as the world's prime superpower. As a response to the Sputnik crisis and the intensifying Cold War, President Eisenhower admitted the Soviets had gotten ahead of the US and suggested a vigorous program to catch back up. To bridge this gap, Eisenhower created an agency that would never allow something this unexpected to happen ever again. And thus, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, otherwise known as ARPA, was born with a clear mission, prevent technological surprise. Eisenhower's highly confidential new agency, ARPA, sought to recruit the most advanced defense contractors and scientists in order to stay ahead of the Soviets in the technical development of American missiles and space projects. A massive retaliation disappeared as a realistic strategy at the time at which the Soviets developed a credible nuclear capability of their own. We therefore went to the doctrine of flexible response which says, in effect, that we will respond in a fashion which is commensurate with the aggression. In other words, we'd meet conventional attack with conventional attack. If we went on to a limited tactical nuclear war, then we would respond with tactical nuclear weapons. And in case of a strategic exchange, we'd respond that way. Among the scientists that were recruited for projects was a psychologist named Joseph Carl Robnett Licklider. Licklider had a radical belief that a marriage of the human mind and computer technology would eventually result in better decision-making. It was revolutionary ideas such as these that at the height of the Cold War were of immeasurable value to ARPA, but it was how Licklider's ideas would become reality that would define the future. Around the same time the Soviets and the Americans entered the space race in the 50s, Prime Minister of Japan Yoshida Shigeru proposed that his country should focus on economic development fueled by technological innovation and science. This ambitious plan would become known as the Yoshida Doctrine. Japan, which had been devastated in the war, was set back 50 years in development and progress as a result. The Japanese people felt that their identity and role in international affairs had become compromised. With the approval of the United States, a condition of the security treaty between the two powers, Japan set forth on the ambitious recovery program that would witness an astonishing economic growth over the next decade. <laughs> She makes 2,100 yen, about $7 a day. Even she works on Sundays, otherwise she can support her life. Yashuhiro Nakasone, a member of the Japanese legislature, believed that nuclear power fit this policy quite well, as it became a driving force behind building nuclear reactors. 
Throughout the world, many believed that this new technology would bring a new wave of prosperity and industrial revolution. So the Japanese government and nuclear industry came to an agreement on nuclear power. But the public were still traumatized from the devastating aftermath of the atomic bomb and were opposed to the change. In order to overcome this reluctance, the government launched a massive public relations campaign highlighting the benefits of nuclear power. The campaign worked, and Japan was now on the road to becoming a nuclear powered country. Over the next decade, the Yoshida Doctrine was incredibly effective as the country's economy had an incredible period of growth. But the boom brought a critical change to society, leading to what would become called Japan's Golden Sixties, an incredibly vibrant, tumultuous time in the country's history. Before the high growth era, the cultural lifestyle of the Japanese people had largely been traditional, and any changes to that culture shifted slowly out of respect for the long established values. The booming economy brought many cultural elements from the West and began shaping society rapidly. Concrete built apartments with blinds and curtains. Color televisions and many other technological advances attracted everyone's attention, many of which were fueled by nuclear power. You hate America, very, very is what you're saying. <laughs> Sean Hannity and fellow. T- when media mogul Rupert Murdoch introduced his overly partisan Fox News channel into a U.S. political environment that was previously dominated by centrist mass media news networks, he was hailed as a savior of truth by many. But others saw through Murdoch's decision and viewed him as someone who would cause the perversion of journalistic integrity. And by this point, Murdoch was well familiar with controversy. In the mid-2000s, Murdoch's British Sunday tabloid, The News of the World, became subject of controversy due to a scandal involving employees from the newspaper who were obtaining information by hacking the phones of celebrities, politicians, and members of the British royal family in the pursuit of stories. Murdoch and his son subsequently testified on several occasions before British MPs, claiming that he had not been aware of the hacking. A hearing that was supposed to run one hour had gone twice that long when suddenly Murdoch's wife leapt out of her seat and ran spectacular interference on a pie filled with shaving foam, aimed at Murdoch by a young protester who was promptly arrested and led away. The hacking scandal caught up with the paper, and as a consequence, turned Murdoch's platform into a worthless asset, leading it to shut down in 2011. But by now, the cost of running a cable news network had fallen far enough to make it economically viable for Murdoch to cater to a strongly partisan minority of the overall U.S. audience. Fox News increasingly gained popularity as it covered subjects in a manner that caused enraged arguments between the left and the right. As 2016 approached, Murdoch's media giant featured a frequent guest who was no stranger to the world of theatrics himself. Within a decade, the Sputnik anxiety had fully reversed and was capped off by the first lunar landing in 1969 and a slow defunding of NASA once the U.S. won the PR battle. But perhaps the most lasting impact didn't come from NASA as much as ARPA, renamed DARPA in 1972, in the wake of growing scandals about Vietnam. ARPA funded the development of ARPANET, the world's first networked electronic computer, and the direct forerunner to the modern internet and many other cutting-edge technologies originating from the radical ideas of Joseph Licklider. Even though the Sputnik panic was a black swan, the United States had the resources and political will to address the challenge head-on, and if nothing else, 
score a dramatic public relations coup. But sometimes unpredictable processes can accelerate much faster than anyone can expect, with dire consequences. In December 1991, the Soviet Union, which had stood since 1922, collapsed, which caused one of the greatest humanitarian crises in all of the 20th century, and almost no one saw the collapse coming. The USSR would find its economic growth slowing in the 1970s and dragging in the 80s. Its expensive military invasion of Afghanistan, growing widespread calls for change, nationalist movements looking to retake political control from Moscow, and a failed coup from communist hardliners, all of this would end up being too much for the USSR's political system to handle. One more question of a general nature that may seem hard, but I'd be interested in your answer, and that is, what, what does the word communism mean to you? If you think of explaining it to people abroad who don't live under this system, how would you sum it up for them? Well, I think that maybe it may be very easily summed up in one word, that is happiness. Near the height of the international prestige of the USSR, the emergent Soviet civil rights movement held the first Glasnost protests at Pushkin Square in Moscow. Protesters demanded access to the closed trial of Yuli Daniel and Andrei Sinyavsky, demanding Glasnost, a word that roughly translated to transparency or public admission. Of the 50 participants and 200 sympathetic onlookers, the state expelled 40 students from the universities and held several leaders in psych wards for up to eight months. Widespread opposition to state corruption was easy to miss as a symptom that could lead to the collapse of the USSR in 1991. Many could see the USSR was failing, and some might have been able to foresee the imminent collapse, but it was nearly impossible to predict its timing. This same lack of predictability was very much apparent in other forces of nature, too, as the nuclear professionals at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant would soon come to learn. As Japan entered the Golden Sixties under Yoshida Shigeru's new policies, the Fukushima prefecture began to shift its focus from coal to the new and attractive nuclear power technology. On the northern edge of the Jovan coal field, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, otherwise known as TEPCO, built its Fukushima Daiichi and Fukushima Daini nuclear power plants, and despite the closure of its coal mines, was able to continue playing the role of an energy supplier to the city of Tokyo. When the construction of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant had begun, Bureaucratic and professional stovepiping made nuclear officials unwilling to take advice from experts outside of the field. And many of those nuclear professionals also believed that a severe accident was simply impossible. TEPCO continued to ignore safety measures and data that would compromise the safety of the Fukushima Daiichi power plant for decades until 2011. What they failed to pay attention to was historic evidence of large earthquakes, tsunamis, and rare seismic events that had the potential to occur once every 10,000 years. And if an event that Japanese researchers had warned about were to occur, the results would be disastrous. And like the collapse of the USSR, when that event might occur was a difficult task to determine. To all Americans tonight, we will make America safe again. 
and we will make America great again. God bless you and good night. I love you. Before he announced his presidential run in June of 2015, Trump had become a frequent guest on Rupert Murdoch's Fox News. The network had given significant support to Trump's divisive commentary on former President Obama, and together with Fox News, became instrumental in giving rise to a new movement of conservative viewers that were effectively angered by the changing world. When Trump declared he was running for the Republican nomination, Fox News journalists were in support, and together they would lead this new rise of right-wing populism in the United States. Political experts doubted how legitimate Trump's presidential run would be, and polls had shown that Democrat Hillary Clinton would win the presidency for months prior to the election. You, the American people. Liberals and doubters were hopelessly optimistic that there was no chance anything like this could happen. What followed would be one of the few black swans to appear in American political history. Put white against black, old against young, uh, I don't know, wealthy against poor, and so on. Doesn't matter. As long as it disturbs society, as long as it cuts the moral fiber of a nation, it's good. And then you just take this country, when everything is subverted, when the country is disoriented and confused, when it is demoralized and then destabilized, then the crisis will come. Popular wisdom has often claimed that the CIA was caught entirely off guard by the Soviet collapse, despite ever better penetration of spies into the halls of power. The truth is more complicated, with many CIA analysts recognizing the instability by the election of Mikhail Gorbachev in 1985. A comprehensive review of intelligence from throughout the U.S. intelligence community provided a consensus that the situation in the USSR would remain bad, but would remain manageable. The CIA disagreed, believing the situation was not manageable. The USSR was born out of two of the most horrific wars in human history, World War I and 1917's Russian Civil War. The former killed 1.5 to 2.5 million, and the latter 7 to 12 million. And then, the USSR would spend half of the 1940s losing another 27 million people, mainly to the Germans in World War II. The first half of the 20th century in Russia was to understate it bleak. But until 1970, things stabilized. Soviet science was often on the cutting edge, and its international prestige would peak, all while the standard of living for the Soviets was on the rise. But as the economic growth began to slow, complex forces of discontent started to soak in. By the 1980s, the USSR had severe issues with consumer goods, slow adoption of computer technology, corruption, and the black market second economy. Escalating political crises rooted in the overlapping party and state functions reduced local overhead and kept political initiative at the top. They were an increasingly old and inflexible generation of career administrators trying to get the economy back into gear. And although the economy had liberalized somewhat in the 1950s, it proved to have limited effects by the early 1980s. When Gorbachev took power, he attempted to liberalize the economy even further. Market liberalization disrupted what had been working with centralized planning and failed to bolster the markets, leading to further instability and unrest in the USSR. <laughs> On March 11, 2011, a powerful earthquake struck the northeastern coast of Honshu, Japan's main island. And although the earthquake caused considerable damage in the region, the large tsunami it created gave rise to much more. Eleven nuclear reactors at four nuclear power plants in the region were operating at the time, most notably TEPCO's Fukushima Daiichi power plant, which had been warned of seismic events. 
The reactors were able to withstand the seismic activity, as experts had warned, but they were no match to the power of the massive wave. Almost an hour after the earthquake, the entire site was flooded by the 15-meter tsunami. Rising heat within the reactor's core caused fuel rods and reactors to overheat and melt down, leading to the release of radiation. In the days that followed, some 47,000 residents were forced to evacuate their homes and were warned of increased levels of radiation in food and water in the area. Journalists described the scene of devastation as covered with mangled trucks, crumpled water tanks, and other debris left by the tsunami, and radioactive levels so high, visitors were only allowed to stay for a few hours. The event was catastrophic. Years prior, TEPCO had been warned their seawall was insufficient to withstand a powerful tsunami, but they did not increase the seawall height in response, which played a big part in the disaster. The tumultuous, abrasive 2016 presidential election defied ordinary presidential races that had occurred up until that point in the United States. Clinton had a significant amount of political experience in comparison to Trump in far superior campaign organization and fundraising. The Democrat had dominated election polls in near totality and was pointed to a comfortable victory on election night. But Trump's anti-establishment appeal to white working class voters in rural America proved to be the key factor in what turned out to be a black swan in politics. On the night of the election, Clinton looked to make history as the first woman president of the United States. But as the night carried on and the votes were counted, Trump continued to make up ground. And although Clinton had won the popular vote, Trump had won enough states to secure the electoral college and took the historic election making him the 45th president of the United States. Tears of joy and horror both filled the streets as Trump waved to his supporters after the long night. Many had realized the country had slowly began shifting into a hyperpolarized state over the course of the years leading up to 2016. But now it was unmistakable as a political black swan had appeared. By 1988, Gorbachev was losing control of the Baltic states, which wanted independence. Western republics such as Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus would also begin pushing for independence. The USSR began allowing broader democratic choices, including candidates from parties other than the Communist Party. Live TV coverage of USSR leaders being questioned and held accountable led Poland and the other five Warsaw Pact countries to push for their independence. By the end of 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, reuniting East and West Germany. 1990 intensified the unrest and political push for local rule and nationalism. The death blow came in August 1991, when Gorbachev moved to restructure the Soviet Union into a federation of independent republics. Gorbachev's vice president and several other high-ranking figures launched a coup to restore communist rule, but it collapsed within three days. Faced with delegitimization thanks to the coup, Gorbachev dissolved the Central Committee of the Communist Party. By December 25, 1991, the Soviet Union was over. As this rush through a complex chain of events shows, it wasn't any one thing that brought down the USSR. Instead, Long-standing internal contradictions spun out of control, and the attempts to bring them under more control magnified the process. Even basic things like the contradictions between socialist images, socialist ideas, socialist hopes, 
and the standard of living provided by the Union. All of these things challenged the Soviet system, but didn't cause the collapse. No individual challenge to the Soviet system could have broken it down, but all of these at once, combined with a failed coup from the government's hardliners, was too much. Even the CIA, with the best spy network within the Soviet bureaucracy they'd ever had, only started predicting the collapse in 1989, the year historians consider the start of the collapse. Nassim Taleb's influential book gave insight into a reality that had been overlooked all too often throughout history. And like philosophers in the past, exposed the hazards of overconfidence and the frailty of certainty in a non-linear world. These three tales capture moments in our history where experts and figures of authority have failed to question their own confidence. They've failed to note their own tendency to make mistakes and ultimately, failed to see the black swan that would appear in the lake that was their collective reality. 